Okay, let's go ahead and get started. A couple of quick announcements. First is that hopefully all of you got emails about the course evaluation. Um, so please do check your PDX email accounts for that um, so you can give me some feedback. Uh, second thing is office hours today are going to be a little shorter because I have to head up the hill and play with the cool microscopes that I mentioned last time. So um, we'll go ahead and do that. A couple people have asked about clicker questions and our guest lecture. We'll do the clicker questions and then we'll switch over, talk about prions, and then switch back again and do T4. Um, George has said that he doesn't mind being recorded, so um, we'll be at that recording and now that will be posted as well. So without further ado, let's um, go to clicker questions for today. Most archaeal genomes, or say, most archaeal viruses package blank genomes, double-stranded DNA, single-stranded DNA, single-stranded RNA positive strand, single-stranded RNA negative strand, or double-stranded RNA. Yay, everyone's happy with that. Yes, they're mostly double-stranded DNA. One of the things that I didn't mention is that there are a few single-stranded DNA genomes in Archaea. So far, um, they're getting to be more and more of them. People are looking really hard to find RNA viruses in Archaea. There's a publication that said there was some, and then we wrote a publication that said they're full of dot, 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 not RNA. Uh, so. <clears throat> I think the, the jury is still out on whether there are RNA viruses in Archaea. Next, the lemon-shaped virion is unique to bacteria Archaea, Eukarya, Kren Archaea, Uri Archaea. Currently, lots of people have different opinions. <laughs> So most people seem to think that it's unique to the Crenarchaea, which includes Sulfalobus. And certainly I spent a long time talking about the Fuzello viruses. 
but we also talked about some uriarchaeal viruses that have some lemon-shaped particles, so it's actually not something which is maybe unique to extreme environments, but it's not just unique to the crenarchaea. So, unfortunately, the answer for everybody except six of you is B. So it's both Uri and Crenarchaea that have them. So the last question, clicker question for today, is the VAP mechanism, virus-associated pyramids. Uh, for virus release is unique to SCIV, SIRV, SSB, AB, or A, B, and C. I did, yes. You might also recognize the fleece jacket from that picture that I showed in the last lecture. <laughs> at the rats and the electrodes or something. <laughs> Keep pushing the button. on this one. Uh, what's really strange, however, about this? That these two are really not related to each other at all. It's just they happen to have one gene which makes these really amazing pyramid structures. So it's, again, really surprising and you know, quite what that gene would be doing, and is it a viral-specific gene? Maybe you can find it in cells. What would cells be doing with these pyramid structures in the outside? Uh, I think it's really mysterious what's going on in terms of uh, those particular structures there. So it is STIV and SIRV. We actually tried really hard, and George Kaysen, who's just about to talk about prions, tried to show this together with Damon here, whether it's doing this for SSV. Certainly seems not to be the case that it's doing it for SSV. Um, we thought that it might be, but that really does not seem to be the case. So with that, um, now we'll switch over um, prions. Those of you who have to leave, we'll do our transfer now, and then we'll talk about prions after that. Then we'll switch back and talk about T4 for the rest of the lecture. All right, so I obviously am George, and I'm a first-year PhD student in Dr. Stedman's lab, and I um, have started work on some of the hybrid viruses that he told you guys about, I guess, almost two weeks ago now. Um, today I'm going to talk about prions and some prion-associated diseases, both of animals and humans. Uh, I'm not an expert in these things, but it's just something that interests me and Back in the early 2000s, I grew up in Central California, and there's lots and lots of dairy cows there and beef cows. Um, and when mad cow was a big concern over in England, it, if you guys remember, became a big concern here. And being in Central California with all the cows, it was a big, big concern there, and that's kind of what got me interested in microbiology in the beginning. So if anybody was interested in that, now you know. So just a quick review, hopefully um, you guys know by now what we've discussed this quarter are obviously viruses. And general overview of a virus is nucleic acid, a mixture of nucleic acid and protein, right? So here's just a kind of a uh, cartoon version of the virus. You have nucleic acid, you have your proteins on the outside here, and 
as we've learned, sometimes there are lipids associated with these viruses. On the other hand, prions are distinct from viruses in that they are protein only. We'll get back to exactly what, um, what these two different, I guess you could say, forms represent here a little bit later. There we go. So, brief overview of prion diseases in animals. Um, scrapie in sheep and sheep, I guess technically sheep and goats. Which you can see a nice representation of here has been known and observed for a couple hundred years in Britain. Um, what it does is it causes sheep to sheep and goats to um, undergo basically a neuro degenerative process. Um, they get tremors, their heads shake. As you can see here, the reason, obviously it's called scrapie, is because they end up scraping all their wool off, and eventually they die. That's the process. Um, because they end up scraping all their wool off, there are significant economic costs associated with this disease. Um, there's not many cases in the U.S., but it is estimated that it costs, I guess, the wool industry, you could say, between 20 and $25 million annually. Um, back in 2007, there was a big push by the AVMA, the American Veterinary Medical Association, to have scrapie eradicated by 2010 in the U.S., so that, they, so that the U.S. could be certified as clear or clean of scrapie by... 2017, I wasn't able to find anything about that actually happening, and the Eradicate Scrapie website is still up, so I'm guessing that the U.S. is not clear of Scrapie yet. Um, so this is what was known about the disease for a long time, and now with, if you want to call microscopes modern, modern technology, um, you can see that people now know that Scrapie and prion diseases in general cause this vacuole formation in the brain. So if this were a normal healthy brain, right, you'd have pink everywhere and a lack of these holes or vacuoles. This is known as spongiform encephalopathy. Um, it's unique, or I guess the symptoms are unique in that you get no inflammation of the brain, no immune response which is what you would expect from an infectious microorganism, right? So as I mentioned, mad cow disease, also known as spon bovine spongiform encephalopathy, BSE, um, emerged in Britain in the 1980s. Became a big, big issue in the 1980s. Um, it's similar to what we just, just discussed in scrapie, and that you get the same, same symptoms of uh, neurodegeneration. You get shaking, tremoring. Eventually, your mus the cow's muscles seize up and they die. There's a question about the original source, what happened in the 1980s that caused this, this boom, so to speak. Um, some people wondered if maybe the agent that caused scrapie had been acquired, so to speak, by cows, and now they had this new problem. Um, it's been shown since then that you can't give cows scrapie, essentially. So if you take brain extracts from infected sheep, inject those into poor cows, the cows do not get scrapie, or what we would call in cows, I guess, mad cow disease. Um, in the 1980s, the costs associated with rendering animal carcasses for feed for cows became much lower, and so there was a big boom, essentially, in the amount of cows that were fed dead cows, essentially. You chop up a bunch of dead cows, feed those to the live cows. And that is now believed what led to this um, emergence or um, spike in cases of mad cow disease. 
so like I said, in the U.S., there was a lot of panic, right, back in the early 2000s. If you guys remember back then, media, um, economic worries. We've had four total cases in the U.S. of mad cow disease. Why is that? Um, in the U.S., soybean is relatively cheap to, compared to the rest of the world, so we feed cows mostly soybean as opposed to chopped up dead cows. Yeah? Is that for outbreaks or for done for? Four total, four total cows. So we feed cows mostly um, an herbivore diet as opposed to dead cows. <laughs> Unfortunately for the cows in Great Britain. Um, before these outbreaks in the U.S., well, before the early 2000 outbreaks, um, there was some feeding of dead cows to cows, but since these early outbreaks, um, the general consensus is now that the dairy and beef industry are in compliance with what are now laws that prevent the feeding of dead cows to live cows. So in the early 2000s, when we had uh, three cases, um, the largest importers of beef from the U.S. shut down their importation of U.S. beef and cost the beef, <coughs> the beef industry approximately $1.5 billion. So there are economic ramifications for this problem. Um, and I believe in the early 2000s, the U.S. was exporting something like 1.5 million metric tons of beef per year. Since then, well, when, when the outbreaks started in the U.S. or the concern started in the U.S. in the early 2000s, uh, a lot of countries shut down their importation of U.S. beef and they still haven't got that back to the levels that we were seeing before the early 2000s. Um, the most recent case was in 2012, California, a dairy cow. And so the panic, mostly back in the early 2000s, was that people were coming down with mad cow disease. Which, and when, when mad cow disease gets passed to humans, it's called new variant Crutchfeld Jakob disease, or NVCJD. And we'll talk more about what <coughs> traditional or old CJD is here in a minute. Um, as far as I know, there are no, there's no direct proof, so to speak, that mad cow disease is what causes new variant CJD in humans. But most cases of um, NV CJD in humans have a direct link, link to beef that is suspected of being contaminated with mad cow disease. Now we'll discuss a couple of the, I guess, classical prion diseases in humans. Uh, the first one is called Kuru. It was discovered in the 1950s in Papua New Guinea in the, the group of people there. Um, again, you see the same types of uh, symptom development that we talked about in animals. You get a progression of tremors to total loss of muscle function, dementia, and you eventually die, invariable, invariably fatal. There are no effective treatments for, for these prion diseases yet. Um, like we discussed on the previous slide, the cultural practices of how cows are raised and fed has a big impact on um, the prevalence of the disease in a cow population, so to speak. Again, in, with Kuru in Papua New Guinea, culture pra cultural practices are believed to be what plays a major role in outbreaks of disease. Um, it's common for many people in a community to interact with people once they've died, between funeral, funeral preparations, uh, ceremonies, things of that nature. Um, lots of people also eat their dead, or ate their dead. I'm not sure if it's still a common practice, but there is a definite link between cannibalism of people who had Kuru and new people coming down with Kuru, which is 
to be expected. Um, when outbreaks do occur, you get a relatively large part of the population coming down with this disease. It's estimated that if you have an outbreak, you can expect at least 1% of your population to die when you are dealing with um, these types of cultural practices, again, where people interact with dead bodies and eventually, in some cases, eat them. Um, so this condition was also has been transferred, so to speak, to chimpanzees in the lab. Again, if you take extracts of infected human brain, inject them into healthy ch chimpanzees, you can induce these symptoms. So as we talked about earlier, the uh, NVCJD, which is thought to arise from eating contaminated beef project, products, uh, we have traditional or old CJD. Um, similar symptoms to what you see with NVCJD, again, central nervous disease, spongiform encephalitic characteristics, the vacuoles in the brain tissue. Interesting thing about CJD is that it has been shown to be both heritable and transmissible, right? So you can get it from your parents, so to speak, you can inherit it, or you can catch it. There are between one and three million cases annually, and as we've discussed earlier, it's invariably, invariably fatal. Um, how it's normally transmitted is up for debate, with an average age of onset being 60. Um, with NVCJD, the average age of onset is in the mid-20s, I think it's about 26. Um, NVCJD has a slower symptom progression, and CJD obviously has a faster symptom progression. So this is just an overview of some of the known prion diseases in different animals. We talked about scrapie in sheep, mad cow, BSE in cattle, CJD, NVCJD in humans, crew in humans. Some of you may be also familiar with this one, the fatal familial insomnia. So now we'll talk a little bit about the development of the prion theory and how people came to discover or how the current thinking on what causes these diseases came to be. Uh, as we talked earlier on the last slide, I showed or told you that these conditions can be given to um, healthy animals, right? So you can extract brain tissue, brain serum from infected animals, inject that directly into the brain of healthy animals, and those healthy animals get sick. Um, interesting things about these extracts is that they are very persistent, meaning that traditional nucleic acid inactivation, um, treatment with UV light, for example, does nothing to the infectivity of these agents. Uh, eventually, a 30 kilodalton protein was isolated from infected sheep, goats, that was not able to be isolated from healthy individuals. Um, a guy named, named Stanley Pruschner at uh, San Francisco coined the term prion, and you can see protonaceous infectious particle. And so the abbreviation for the scrappy agent, well now known to be a protein, is PRP, with a little SC here. So now the question is, where does this prion protein come from? So now it's known that the prion protein is actually encoded by the host. So if you remember back here, we have essentially two different forms, this PRP, prion protein, scrappy, and this PRPC, which is prion protein cellular. Um, the cellular form is found on the surface of lymph lymphocytes, neurons, and dendritic cells. Uh, this would be considered a, a healthy form, so to speak. You find these prion proteins um, 
in most mammals. So as we talked earlier, this is, would be the cellular form. So if you have the PRP BSE form, you have mad cow disease. If you have PRP CJD form, you have crutchfield jakob disease. Uh, the function of what it does in these mammals is not well understood. Well understood. There's some evidence that this interminous region here plays some role in prevention of apoptosis. Um, there's other proposed functions that you can see here. Um, none of these have been shown to be definite as of now. There's also some knockout organisms with, of this PRPC form. They seem to function fine. You have knockout mice that function fine. There's actually now knockout cattle that are fine, I guess seven years ago now. They were fine at 20 months. So the question is, what does this PRPC protein do for, it, for the, the host, so to speak? This down here is just a, a cartoon of what the prion protein looks like, 254 amino acids and some of the um, domains of interest are noted here, and we'll get back to these alpha helices here in just a second. So as we talked earlier, there are essentially two forms of these prion proteins, one being the form that is encoded by the host, the healthy form, the other form being the infectious, infectious form. This is a simple cartoon of what happens. You have one form being healthy, right, and it's somehow converted into this unhealthy or disease-causing form. You can see here that in the healthy form you have, in the cellular form, I guess we should just say to keep the nomenclature consistent, uh, you have these alpha helices here, and you can see in the uh, disease form, those have been converted into beta sheets. But because there's no nucleic acid associated, or no nucleic acid that's been found to be associated with these proteins, the question is, how does this form turn into this form? Sorry, I should say there's no nucleic acid associated with, with the, uh, the unhealthy or diseased form, right? The nucleic acid for these comes from the host. So there's two theories currently about how you go from the cellular or healthy form into the diseased, in this case, the scrappy form. One says that... Um, these are both stable forms, so there's a conversion that's prevented by energy, right? So if you remember back to biochemistry, which things are things that I don't remember at this point, there's a reason, right, that you have a, a homeostasis here. And what happens in this theory is that uh, you have your introduction of your unhealthy form, which binds to your healthy form and essentially just converts it into um, the unhealthy form here. This seeding model is what's depicted up here too. I thought this was a better picture. This is what's in your, in your book. Um, in this model, as opposed to um, a conversion of the healthy form, you have unhealthy forms aggregating together and eventually forming enough um, they essentially, the theory says that these unhealthy forms will sequester any unhealthy forms that are out there and uh, eventually you'll get disease that way. So there is some debate about um, whether the proteins are truly autonomous, so to speak, or not. Um, they share a lot of characteristics with viruses, which is why I thought that it might be appropriate to talk about this stuff during this class. Um, right, so as we know from earlier in the quarter, viruses are small, filterable, if you remember back to TMV. Um, and so these are things that prions share with them. Small, filterable, 
requirement for a host cell viruses, right? So we've learned this quarter, don't do any reproducing outside of cells. Um, they have no capacity for metabolism on their own, right? The distinct difference, though, is that um, these prions are resistant to nucleic acid degradation. There are some that think that these prions are just products of very, very small viruses that have been yet to be discovered. Um, I guess my issue with that would be that technically you should be able to purify these viruses out with the scrappy protein, with the infectious protein, in theory at least. Um, there's also a number of human diseases that are now known to be caused by incorrect folding, release, or localizations of proteins, um, cystic fibrosis, type 2 diabetes, a couple examples. So this is um, a paper from 2007 from a group at Yale that looked with electron microscopes at infected sheep brains, right, so scrappy. And what they are seeing here, or claim to see, are virus-like particles, 25 nanometers, I think, if I remember correctly, that are associated with, right, these infected sheep. They don't see these, at least they don't show data, that they see these in, um, in healthy sheep brains. You can see vacuoles here. Um, this is the only data in the paper that they present to support the presence of a virus. So I'm not, in reading through this paper at least, I was not convinced. Um, you know, if they did other experiments, they left them out conveniently because it doesn't, doesn't support what they are saying goes on here. So I'm not convinced just based on what are essentially black dots. So uh, as we talked earlier, genetics, or sorry, um, prion diseases are both heritable, right? You can get them um, from your parents and they're transmissible. Um, a single exon in, in humans encodes for this prion protein the cellular form. Um, humans who are homozygous for valine at amino acid 129 of this protein appear to be more susceptible to both um, the heritable and the sporadic CJD. This has been shown by looking at victims of NVCJD mad cow essentially, during the British outbreaks and it was found that every single individual that came down with NVCJD was homozygous for valine at 129. Um, most of the Kuru victims are also homozygous there. Um, there's also unexpectedly or surprisingly so to speak high levels of heterozygosity at amino acid 129 in this PRPC among humans which to some may suggest coevolution or at least a long relationship with these prion diseases. So just to quickly review, prions are distinct from viruses. At least that's the current thinking and understanding is that they are proteins as opposed to viruses. Um, many spongiform encephalopathy diseases I should say caused, are caused by infectious or heritable proteins. I guess the big takeaway here is that these diseases currently are fatal within a year of symptom onset. There's no, no treatments. Um, and as we discussed, there's currently two models for the propagation or conversion of the healthy form to the disease-causing form. So that's all. I have for you guys. Yeah. Um, so the digestive system when you eat this protein, it doesn't like that seems kinda of odd that the protein is right, so it's, stored in your system. So if you remember back all the way there's a picture I showed you right there of cows. I don't know if you guys can tell, those are hooves. Those are dead cows being disposed of. Uh, the infectious form is stable up to 600 degrees. 
So I guess it's not surprising so much that it um, is not digestible, so to speak. It's also the healthy form of the protein is susceptible to proteinase activity, but the unhealthy form is not. So it's a pretty robust little protein. That's a good question. In humans, I don't know. It's been shown in yeast that they, I believe that Saccharomyces uh, cerevisiae has eight proteins that can be converted, and they, they're not calling those prion proteins yet, but they have eight, I guess, candidate proteins that appear to be acting like prions there. As far as I know, there's no shedding, right? And so the, the biggest issue is basically not feeding cows that were infected with BSE to live cows. Yeah. So I don't know if it's gone that way, so to speak, but I know um, dementia onset is a symptom of prion disease. I'm not sure that there have been, I'm not aware, I didn't come across any studies that went the other way. Yeah. Um, so how is CKD, how is it uh, transmissible? How is it transmissible? So in, for humans, right, if you essentially eat a dead human that had CJD, you're chances of getting it are very good. Um, how it's transmissible, the, the natural transmission is not fully understood. There's medical procedures that have transmitted it from person to person. Um, some procedures having to do with like cornea transplants. People have come down with CJD after that. Um, blood, there's blood donor restrictions if you've been to areas where CJD is common, so that's another, another way that it, um, hypothesize at least to be transmitted, but the the natural, so to speak, way is not fully understood. Yeah. That I do not know. Bind to another PRPC or this homodimer binds to homodimer? So in, in, in this second theory here? Just overall. Yeah, so, so here you have binding of this unhealthy form to the healthy form and the conversion of the healthy form into the unhealthy, right? So you have healthy, unhealthy, and here you have two unhealthies, which can then go on to kind of propagate the process, so to speak. Here, I believe, my understanding at least, is that um, it's more of a sequestration process. So if there's this around, you're eventually going to have large numbers of these present, which lead to disease, which will overcome the effect of these. So once the homodimer is formed, that's it. It doesn't bind stuff. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Equally possible. I suppose they're both equally possible. I don't know. I think it kind of goes, there's an argument or discussion, we'll say. Discussion back and forth about which, which is more accurate. Okay, so let's thank George. Thank you. And now for something completely and utterly different. <laughs> Bacteriophage T4. How many of you have your giant microbe T4? That would be me. Uh, this is, yeah, so giantmicrobes.org, you can get you now MRSA, you can get E. coli, you can get all kinds of you know, really fun things on there. But one of the great things are the little package inserts 
you know, like when you, you know, go to the pharmacist and get something, it's always a good idea to read the package insert. So I'm going to read the package insert here. Those of you just in case haven't heard, heard about it before. Facts. T4 bacteriophage may look like something out of a science fiction movie, but if you're an E. coli bacteria, it's the stuff of your nightmares. <laughs> this real-life microscopic monster isn't just hiding under your bed. It's hunting you, feeling for you with its six deadly feet. When they finally touch your skin and know that you are there, they grip onto your flesh like talons. Paralyzed with fear, you wait and watch as a tremendous tusk-like stinger stabs you mercilessly through the middle. Writhing in pain, you feel your predator's deoxyribonucleic acid, <laughs> DNA, being injected slowly, menacingly into your very being. It's, it's here. This is a direct quote. <laughs> You try to resist, of course, but it is futile. Your contaminated body starts to grow new copies of the malevolent abomination that has corrupted your soul. <laughs> In less than an hour, actually about half an hour, a legion of fiends is swarming inside you. They grow and grow and grow until you are broken, until finally you explode disappearing into a void of nothingness. <laughs> By day, T4 has played important roles in a number of scientifically significant experiments. It has hobnobbed with Nobel Prize winning scientists and has whispered some of the secrets of mutation genetics to them. It has advanced our understanding of viral infection and may someday help to control pathogenic bacteria. But don't let the cool scientific demeanor fool you. <laughs> T4 always has one eye of the two. On the horizon, waiting for the sun to set, waiting for the hunt to begin. <laughs> so um, that's our, you know, yeah, looks like a you know, friendly, happy virus here. So um, <laughs> that being said, uh, I am, you know, fine. It's really nasty if you're E. coli, really nice if you're not E. coli. Uh, molecular biology, I would say, again, people will argue about this, you know, 80 to 90 percent of what we know about molecular biology comes from the study of um, this menacing fiend here. Uh, DNA is the genetic material. The genetic code is a linear and triplet code. Termination codons, DNA repair, recombination, blah, 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 comes from the study of this little guy, and much more importantly, what's inside the capsid um, right here. The other thing to mention is that, not terribly surprisingly, because it's so good at what it does, um, that there are lots and lots of viruses like this around. So if you do studies, again, like those little green dots that you see when you look at marine samples or soil samples or anything like that, you'll very often see something that looks like uh, bacteriophage T4. Um, people also will call these the, the myoviruses. A couple of key concepts about T4. Uh, the genome, as I mentioned in molecular biology, I'm not sure if Dr. Singer did as well, this genome is circularly permuted. And so what that means is that the ends are redundant relative to each other, and it's pretty big. The redundancy here is about 5,000 nucleotides at each end of the genome. What's packaged is not regular cytosine, it's hydroxymethylcytosine, uh, which is a really amazing evolutionary trick, if you want to call it that, although, you know, just has happened through evolution. Um, but if you have a different nucleotide that you use, clearly you can get away with and avoid a lot of the host defense mechanisms. This group of viruses, curiously enough, doesn't have its own RNA polymerase, but it highly modifies the host RNA polymerase. And a lot of what we know about the host RNA polymerase actually is from understanding how the virus has modified that particular host RNA polymerase. Uh, one of the really, I think, fascinating aspects about the T4 genome is it really uses recombination for replication. And at first people thought this was just really, you know, totally bizarre and, you know, who should care about it. it turns out that a lot of DNA repair mechanisms have to do with recombination and understanding recombination for getting 
across some of the big problems that happen when you have DNA damage. So it turns out that this recombinational approach, it's absolutely critical for how T4 replicates, but also we learn a lot about how DNA repair works. The virus is really pretty autonomous. Um, yes, it does depend on the cellular RNA polymerase, but other than that, it's really pretty autonomous. Uh, highly redundant, a lot of the processes that it uses in terms of modifications. You can make a whole bunch of mutations in the T4 genome and still have functional virus uh, under various different conditions, which is probably one of the reasons why it's been such a great model. So you can make a bunch of different mutations. You can make lots of conditional mutations, et cetera. And the virus works reasonably well, not quite as well as it used to. So the classic example going back for looking at the genetic code being linear um, and single molecule has to do with the R mutations. And so these are rapid lysis mutations, which are perfectly, the virus is perfectly happy under some conditions, but not happy under others. And so you can use that really nicely for studying these kinds of things. And then, you know, the use of cellular processes, which allows it to be such a model in terms of understanding what's going on. So again, go through our sort of standard stuff here. Um, depending on where we get to by, you know, 10.05, that's just going to be the stuff that's on the exam. Um, we'll see how far we get. I'm probably going to get to the whole end here. Um, probably one of the most amazing things about these virions is that they have this almost, you know, paradigm of the virus kind of shape. Uh, one thing that you'll notice that giant microbes didn't quite get right is that the head is much more elongated, which you can see here really quite nicely, um, but then also uh, the tail and tail fibers. And just in case you thought um, what we're doing today isn't enough, um, you can borrow the textbook um, on bacteriophage T4, um, which is all here. Where do these guys come from? No, not giant microbes. Uh, there is a really fun article which Steve Abaddon, who's at uh, Ohio State, wrote on the murky origin of Snow White and her tea even dwarves. So goes through the whole history of, of where a lot of these uh, micro, microbes came from originally, probably from sewage, um, which if you're looking for viruses that infect E. coli, where's the E. coli? So it's a really good place to find it. Uh, Around 1940, um, characterized by a couple of guys in 1945. Um, unfortunately, for a long time, people had different names for these things. They would call them alpha, they would call them beta, et cetera. And it was really Max Delbrook who sort of got all these guys together and said, hey, no, we really need to standardize what we're talking about here. So let's just talk about these individual type bacteriophages. And so T4, okay, yes, you can buy this. No, I, I don't have stock of the company. You know, I don't get a commission, but it is so cute. Um, but the way that these guys were originally characterized had nothing to do with their virion morphology. It had everything to do with plaques. And so this is, and I should have brought one of my plaques because we do these plaques in the lab as well. In fact, the recombinant lab did T4 plaques, right? You guys did T4 plaques? Those of you who aren't preparing for your presentations later today, that's probably all the people taken off. Uh, but <clears throat> these uh, are really typical plaques, and it was the difference in the plaque morphologies, which is how Delbrook and Co. decided on what they wanted to name each of these different types of the bacteriophage. So we talked about T7, um, potovirus, really short, and has a very interesting replication system, completely different than bacteriophage T4, completely at random. T2, T4, and T6 turn out to be extremely similar to each other, um, even though they have different plaque morphologies. And so the T-even bacteriophages basically are extremely similar to each other. So, but originally, again, it came up from these, these plaque assays. You can get really high titers quite easily, so you know, 10 to the minus 8 plates, sometimes even 10 to the minus 9. We've gotten titers in the lab up to about 10 to the 12th um, per milliliter. So you can get really large amounts of these. Uh, the virion itself, um, yeah, some people call this the T-Rex of bacterial pathogens. Um, I quite like that. In fact, it's you know, way more complicated, I think. Um, and my personal opinion is a lot cooler than T-Rex. It's kind of boring. But um, the <clears throat> virion itself is really pretty amazing. It's got all of these different proteins 
that are associated with the actual virion itself. And I'm not going to go through all of them here, but basically on the complete flip side to some of the you know, simple icosahedral viruses we've talked about that have one capsid protein, these guys have at least 30, probably as many as 50 different capsid proteins that they put together in about half an hour after infection, which is pretty mind-blowing in terms of you know, putting together a structure like this. Uh, the head, as I mentioned before, is an elongated icosahedron, um, not regular icosahedron, but still has five-fold symmetry um, at each of the corners. It's just it's stretched between one end and the other. Uh, the tail structure here um, is at least, as if not more complex than the head structure per se. And it's a really pretty long tail structure. And we looked at the animation before where, you know, what was it, the, you know, plunging the tusk into the poor unsuspecting uh, <coughs> E. coli. Um, so this is a great example of one of those mixed kind of symmetry. The capsid is both helical in the tail, but icosahedral in the head structure. So you've actually got both of these. And again, it, it does make sense if you think about how are you going to put together, even these lots and lots of proteins, um, they still have to fit together in a relatively equivalent fashion to each other. So you have the major capsid protein up here, uh, which does most of that structure. And it's just the minor capsid proteins that are either stuck on the outside or at the five-fold axis of symmetry, and particularly at the vertex here where you have the injection. There are hundreds of genes present in this genome, um, 170 approximately kilobase pairs in size, and of course, as we mentioned before, hydroxymethylcytosine, which is there. What happens during this 30-minute infection cycle? This is basically everything you need to know about bacteriophage T4 replication, um, but there's a lot going on here. When I say replication, I really mean the whole virion from infection to making more of the virus particles. So the first thing that happens, of course, is you have interaction with receptors on the outside, conformational change where you contract the tail. And this is, in fact, how a lot of people characterize these viruses. It's a bacteriophage head and tail with a contractile tail. And so that contraction of the tail basically bores a hole in the membrane, and then the DNA is released. This double-stranded, again, about 170,000 base pairs in length. As soon as it gets inside the cell, you have early transcription that takes place. The early proteins are just like in all the other viruses we've talked about so far, mostly involved in messing around with cellular processes. The most obvious one here is that there are lots of nucleases, which are in these early proteins, which chop up the host chromosome and also all the host messenger RNA. And the way that the virus, of course, can get away with that is it's not using regular nucleotides. It's got this hydroxymethylcytosine, which it's using. So that's also one of the early proteins. Once you use these nucleases to break things down into those individual nucleotides, now you can modify them in such a way that they can be incorporated into the virus genome, but then never incorporated back into the host genome. So these DNA precursors then become part of your replicating DNA. You also have translation that takes place. Translation, first again, of these early proteins, but then the later proteins, which are mostly those that are involved in making your capsid. Um, capsids are made in basically two parts. You make the head structure, you make the tail structure, and you make these really individually. You have a one piece after the next. And the process is really, I think, amazing in terms of its orchestration. The other thing that you can do with these individual particles is you can purify just heads and purify just tails and put them back together. Um, in 
vitro or in glass. Of course, nobody uses glass test tubes anymore. I call it in plastico because you're using these plastic uh, vials. But um, you can take the individual pieces and just put them together, and they will assemble by themselves. It's really a pretty amazing process. And this has allowed us to understand a lot about the virus assembly process. So you make these heads. These heads are scaffolded. Um, so there's a scaffolding protein, which is the inside, which is no longer present in the final particle. So you make this head uh, proteins, put them all together. You lose the scaffolding. Then what happens is this head, which is now empty, gets filled up with DNA. Once it's filled up with DNA, it can attach to one of these tail structures, and then these guys are released. You need to, of course, make the DNA as well. That happens through this pretty regular, at least starting out with, origin of replication, RNA-primed replication. But very soon after you've made that first copy of the genome, and actually this first partial copy of the genome, then you have massive amounts of strand invasion that take place. And so the strands that you're making will invade another strand. That's going to provide a three prime end that the polymerase can take over. It's a, cell, a, a sorry, viral DNA polymerase here. Um, this other three prime end is going to provide a three prime end that can undergo strand invasion over on another one and so on and so forth. So you end up with this really you know, cross-linked, in fact, kind of mess of DNA, which ends up making multiple concatamers, so genomes attached one to each other uh, with these ends, again, about 5,000 nucleotides at each end, which are identical to each other. Um, those get packaged through standard packaging motor um, that will stuff in as much DNA as will fit inside one of these capsids. 170 kb of DNA inside that particular head structure is really packed. It's almost crystalline on the inside, um, that packaging process. And so once you have that completely packaged, that again gets chopped off, and then you can assemble the tail structure on the end of that. So this is you know, basically an overview of what's going on there. You've got that whole assembled particle, and uh, probably don't have time to go through the whole video, but again, I've, I've shown this to you before. When you look at virus particles, um, virions, I should say, when they're released, the tail fibers are actually folded up um, underneath the head structure. And so this is basically that particle. It's only when you have interactions of these whiskers on the outside, which are sensing the E. coli, uh, that now you have the release of the tail fibers. And so that's, again, just shown here. Once you have the long tail fibers released, they interact with lipopolysaccharide, just on the outside of many different kinds of cells, not just E. coli, and then some specific outer membrane proteins. And if you look at the process, basically you have to have three of your six long tail fibers that interact with LPS in an appropriate way, then the outer membrane proteins are going to be what the base plate proteins, which are down here at the bottom, are going to interact with. You have multiple conformational changes, and that's what's in the video, um, which cause not only the opening up of the structure at the bottom, the talons, which are going to reach into the cell, and then also the contraction of the tail structure, which is going to inject through the membrane. Now, it's not just that injection process. You also have enzymes, which break down the peptidoglycan, which are also present in the virion structure. So here in the base plate, you've got a number of enzymes that are going to break things down. Again, you've probably seen this movie multiple different times, so I'm not going to go through it right now. Uh, did, however, want to mention a little bit about the genome. Again, I mentioned before, 170,000 base pairs, linear double-stranded DNA, terminal redundancy, which means you've got identical sequences at each end, which means you can draw the map as a circle because those ends overlap with each other. And so people almost always draw the genome of bacteria of HT4 as a circle, even though it's always packaged as linear, and it only is linear inside the cell. It doesn't recircularize like lambda. Um, again, hydroxymethylcytosine. A um, couple things I wanted to mention in here. Uh, there are topoisomerases in the genome. There are 
clamp loaders up here at the top, sliding clamp also gives you a really good idea what's going on in terms of what's encoded for in this genome. Yes, it uses the cellular RNA polymerase, but all of the DNA mechanisms are phage encoded. In fact, a lot of what we know about replication in E. coli comes from studying the sliding clamp, the helicase, et cetera, from bacteriophage T4. There's also here a sigma factor, which is encoded in the viral genome. So again, host RNA polymerase, but how do you recognize the appropriate genes, particularly for the late transcription? It's through a viral sigma factor. And then also want to just point out R2, because that's the totally cool region which um, Seymour Benzer used in terms of understanding these things. tRNAs, this was the first viral genome that anybody found tRNAs in, um, way before Mimi virus or any of these other crazy ones. Uh, and it turns out that these tRNAs do seem to be important for translating the viral genome into protein. And if you look at just codon usage of the viral proteins versus cellular proteins, they clearly use more of the codons that these tRNAs are coding for as opposed to the other ones. I could go through the next 15 slides, but um, I think this is a good ending point. Um, and we'll stop here. Review on Friday. Please fill out those online evaluations. On those, please mention what you think about clickers. Good, bad, indifferent, horrible, hate them, awesome. Do all your exams with clickers. Um, please mention that.